let me give you a bit of background of, of what we are discussing today. Uh, so in the process of discussing with other members of the community, uh, we had a number of discussion on, you know, something that we find really repeating uh, and really becoming somehow a pattern of, of inner source implementation, which is the concept of internal developer platform. So, so what's extremely interesting with the internal developer platform is, on one hand, internal developer platform has been extremely helpful in my experience to help with the adoption of inner source practices. The reason is because it, it creates a common ground of, of standardized access to tooling uh, that people across multiple teams can obviously refer to and access. And that also makes the ability for developers to go into you know, a cross team or, or into a new project extremely uh, fast and it's extremely effective for onboarding new developers as well. Yeah, so a lot of metrics that you'll recognize, they, they tend to be metrics we measure in terms of inner source practice and what it promotes. Yeah. Um, on, on the other end, inner source practice themselves are also interesting in the concept of implementing an internal developer platform. Why? The platform obviously is common to all the technology members on the organization. So when you actually leverage inner source practice, across the organization to contribute new blueprint uh, that are reusable by your colleague, then guess what? You're actually uh, encouraging uh, sharing best practice, sharing code, uh, sharing project, and sharing different technical approach across your communities. So it's a very interesting concept from my point of view because it fits on uh, inner source practice, but it's also encourage them. Uh, so today we are going to give you uh, a bit of our experience with internal developer platform uh, implementation and the, the type of advantages and benefits we have seen, in particular with regards to adoption of inner source practices. Uh, so, you know, we, we will start a bit with a presentation of the problem uh, by my colleague, Luis, uh, and then I will share with you some of the work I have started. So it's, it's really, really starting work around building a, a, an inner source pattern of it. Uh, and then we'll go into some presentation of an opinionated architecture and some demo. All right, so Luis, off to you. Thank you, Vincent. Good morning, everybody. Okay, so let's start with the problem. Uh, so uh, talking about the challenges of traditional DevOps in software development, uh, we have a few problems, right? The cognitive load, which has increased with traditional DevOps because uh, every team will do uh, the beyond the tasks of, of development, right? That the teams are already doing. It, they have to do the operations, infrastructure, and uh, Every uh, these these additional tasks will will cause a lot of uh, job insatisfaction and burnout because they have to learn other than the the development regular tasks that already have right a lot of uh, things you 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 have to you have to know regarding the software uh, architecture best practices, everything. They also have to learn how to manage infrastructure, write scripts, and everything beyond the, the regular development tasks. Uh, the complexity is scale. So with the growth of cloud, software as a service, and technologies like containers, we have the managing software scale because uh, these applications, people are developing their own machine, will have to scale in production servers and they also have to manage this. Uh, it has also blurred the boundaries and responsibilities because uh, with this new development approach, the teams are not fully responsible of, of each phase. So they also have to do the development but if they want to do something new regarding with the infrastructure, they will have to take these tasks. 
and the infrastructure team will not take it. So for some teams, the infrastructure team will do something, but for others, they will not. So it is where the boundaries. And divergence in approach. So the approaches of each teams might be different because these teams are doing their own approaches of the development, delivery, and infrastructure. So the majority of, of the companies have, have been stuck right in the middle of DevOps uh, maturity level. Because they will, they will never, never get to the high level. So for the platform successor to uh, resolve these issues, uh, you can have the final like four clusters of success criteria with some metrics. So the first success criteria is the operational performance. Uh, so if we like you know uh, the I think the one of the most good parts of the DevOps is that we have everything we started started to have everything as code. Uh, mostly with DevOps. I know before we had we had scripts to, to build the platform, everything like that. But mostly with DevOps, we started to version the scripts and start building uh, a development culture for the infrastructure as well. So uh, bringing the these benefits right to the uh, to the infrastructure platform as well. So in automated success code, self-service, and hardware and product continually improves, right? Uh, which will lead time to provision, time to spin up the new development environment and hand over to a customer. So this is one metric. The, the platform should reduce, right? Time to spin up, lead time to onboard new team, uh, number of tasks automated, number of automated integrated CI CD pipelines, and mean time to recovery. So, with a, uh, a fully automated platform that will also uh, help to onboard new developers and new team members uh, with automated tasks, so you don't have to, for example, open a new ticket to create a user on your platform, on your uh, instant management system. So when you create a new member, this has to be everything automated. So these people don't have, doesn't have to look for the document of how to open a ticket to get a new user created. The workload adoption, uh, drive workload migration, and where possible, make the platform enterprise wide shared services. So this is a very important topic. So your platform has to be shareable, right? So the services you make available, uh, the number of services in the platform is the metric because you know, the, the most users you get in the platform, these people will, will also make the services available for, for everybody else to use. So you reduce the duplicated code, duplicated services, you know, and increase the, the, the software delivery. Uh, so, which is the, the common right? Use of services and configuration of services over development. Uh, this is very important because if you already have a service to do something, like for example, you're a bank and you need a service to retrieve the customer data. Uh, and another team is, is starting a new service that needs this customer data. The service is already, is already available. They don't have to develop it again, right? So it will increase the, the delivery time. Uh, teams and collaborative practices. So self service platform, becomes the center of high-performing integrated teams. 
which means uh, with a, an integrated platform where everything self-serves, people will start contributing to it to make it uh, even more uh, available for everybody. So the metrics we can use are adoption rate, so the number of people using the platform, time to pull first story from the backlog using the self-service uh, functionality, time and accuracy of sprint completion, customer NPS, and abandonment rate. So we, uh, we, we are going to evaluate how much people are using the platform, how likely they will recommend other uh, persons to use it, and how much they are leaving and not using. Some other area. And the platform people and practices. So it's an experience based practices that enable individuals, teams, and communities to be transparent, collaborative, and accountable. So we're, you should not just put the platform and save people starting using it. It is a collaborative platform the idea behind the IDP. So it has got to be collective and and people can be able to should be able to to contribute. So uh, business and policy focused uh, aligning to organization, communities of privacy, transparency of information across stakeholders and teams, continuous learning, testing boundaries and markets and team efficiency, which is the number of customers and platform team members. So these people uh, are encouraged to create communities of practice, uh, be transparent and share information to each other so they can uh, contribute to the uh, platform success, right? reasons I give the word back to you. Thank you, Luis. Uh, so I, I think you've, you know, we've discussed a number of metrics and I think both of you are familiar with inner source implementation and communities. I think you would have recognized that actually a lot of these metrics should sound relatively familiar with some of the metrics we measure to look at success of inner source uh, community and practice. In, in fact, my personal experience is that, you know, you can start your inner source journey probably without this kind of platform, but if you're really trying to scale across a number of projects and across of, you know, a, a high number of teams uh, across the organization, and in particular, when you are in an international setup and a lot of people, you know, do this kind of work remotely, you will most likely reach a point where having a standardized development platform across the community is a necessity. So, so that's where personally I see a very, very deep correlation and obviously a pattern uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, what we do at Inner Source Commons. So I've started to actually write uh, a pattern, just actually uh, you know, raise a, an issue now uh, into our main pattern repo to start getting you know, some inputs from the community. So that's probably going to be a call to action after this, if you are interested, have a look and actually help us improve the pattern. But I wanted to share with you, I would say, you know, what I've seen in terms of some essential drivers uh, from a, a pattern uh, point of view. Uh, uh, bear in mind as well, and I, I kind of summarize this on, on the side is, at, at the end of the day, the biggest driving factor for me is actually the positive impact you have on the velocity and happiness of the team. Uh, if, if your development team have better velocity, they are happy to take on new projects because, you know, it's easier to get started. Then you are much more likely to be successful at inner source practice because with inner source, we want to be able to quickly move developers to contribute across communities, especially to achieve common good, like common recipe, common technology deployment. Uh, so, so, so that ability for people to easily switch is supremely important. Uh, a few key levers, uh, and you know, I, I'll start with the one that's often like the shiny object, 
that everyone look at, which is important, but actually not probably the most important item, right? Is is the self service portal. A lot of people in the community have asked me about Backstage, and you know, Reda to actually started contributed to Backstage uh, a, a while ago. Uh, obviously, because we we love the technology and we really believe in it. But a lot of time, what I tell people is, you know, the 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 self service portal is almost the last mile uh, in your implementation of an in, internal developer platform. The reason is the portal gives you this easy ability to provision and to trigger automation. But if you don't have any automation at the back in terms of your development process, the code repository, the virtualization, the infrastructure management, then the portal is just going to be a shiny object for people to look at. And so it's very important to, to realize this because I'm asked time and again to discuss about, hey, backstage, I want to implement a portal. I love implementing portal, but 99% of the work is actually behind the portal. You know, it's, it's what you actually make accessible through it. Um, which brings me to the second level, which is standardized tooling and workflow. The starting point really from a developer is, do you have standardized development environment, automated CI, CD pipelines, monitoring system? You need to be able to ensure consistency across development team. If I don't know what tooling is going to take care of my code, uh, it's very difficult to switch team and context. Uh, now, we also need to make sure the developer's life is improved. And a big part of, you know, I would say the, the enterprise life of a developer that personally as a developer I never liked is having to enforce governance, security, and, you know, all, all kinds of policies that I may not even be aware as a developer. And I kind of find out during testing time, generally kind of two days before having to, to put my software in production. So that, that's not extremely good from an experience point of view. If you can start to build those guardrails for governance as part of the developer journey with pre-configured security policy, access controls, you know, like monitoring is, is an int a very interesting one, right? With, with open telemetry as a technology, we started to be able to instrument observability. So rather than having to code observability and, and add dozens of lines of code every time I build a new service, I can just instrument tracing, I can just instrument logging. All those things make developer lives a lot more efficient and it also standardized delivery. Yeah, so it's all plus points here. Uh, pluggable architecture, so a good internal developer platform, it lets team create new capability and easily integrate them. So that is also extremely important to the development of healthy inner source community. Because when you have a new capability, what's well, the next thing you want to do is to share it with the rest of the organization. If it's easier, because from an architecture point of view, it's like very modular, you can just add this capability and share them across, then you are going to promote and repeat success because people will want to do the same thing once they build a new functionality. Yeah, you, it could create a lot of emulation and desire to share. Next, so... I mentioned this, right? It's an interesting uh, almost situation that we have here because I would say internal developer platform, in my experience, they have a tremendous impact in terms of scaling inner source practices. I wouldn't say they are necessary on day one, but the moment you want to scale, they are actually a big contributor of scaling inner source practices, in my experience. But at the same time, uh, I've started recently a number of internal developer platform implementation with a number of customers of Red Hat. Some are actually uh, in the financial services, others are in telco. And we have actually started to promote the adoption of inner source to achieve success of internal developer platform deployment. And one of the reasons we do this is because we have, find, we have found that when organizations just go into implementation of developer portal uh, and development platform, but they don't have those culture and practices to build reusable components across team. Mm -hmm. Then we get into the situation of what I call the spaghetti developer portal, yeah, which is you have a developer portal and then over time you have hundreds of different modules that people are just kind of bumping into the portal because they built it but actually a single team using that module. Yeah, that is not a good situation. 
the right situation for an internal developer platform is if you have a common component that needs to be used across team, let's say, for example, you have 15 development team that needs to provision PostgreSQL database day in, day out, right, for development, testing, production. Then those teams should be involved in provisioning the component. They should work with operation and security to make sure the blueprint is secure and can scale. And then once it's done, then you make it widely available. And so that's why it's so important as well to have some kind of inner source practice and community built around adopting internal developer platform and practices. And the last bit, we have discussed it uh, just now, all this actually needs a reasonable amount of good automation at the back uh, to provision infrastructure. So putting all these components together, we've started to look at a very high level uh, a, a visualization of this pattern. And the way I look at it personally is very, you know, three simple layers. There's a layer, which is the developer interface, the self-service portal. Generally with this, you want to see environment provisioning, integration with CI/CD tooling, documentation and access to template is extremely important, right? So to me, they go together, by the way. As a developer, I like to see the documentation not of a product or a technology, but rather the documentation of a pattern. Yeah, so it documents like multiple sets of tooling or technology together solving a problem. It's a lot more efficient. And then obviously access to monitoring. Yeah, raising a ticket to get logs or tracing or information, again, is not fun for developers. You can put this in the portal. But what is very actually key in the value is kind of the middle layer, which is the internal developer platform core component, which you will see in action in the demo. For this, you need an orchestration engine because orchestration engine is where we build the developer workflow. Yeah, the, the goal of the orchestration engine, I like to say, is to become ticketless. You don't want people to open ticket anymore. You want people to choose a service or a pattern and then orchestration engine kicks in. And if you need three, four types of capability at the back, it will orchestrate them. Template and scaffolding is how we build repeatability. Yeah, so recipe. And then CI, CD pipeline, you know, infrastructure automation, and then plugin architecture that helps you leverage existing automation as well as API component integration so that, you know, people can easily scale. And then at the back, obviously, you have all the traditional platform services, which probably, you know, all of you have some level of automation of them, but you basically give an access to them. And so that's for what the pattern looks like right now. And let's go now into some kind of uh, uh, reference architecture of this uh, uh, with the work that uh, we, we have done with uh, Humanitech. All right. Thank you, Vincent. So what you're seeing right here is one of our reference architectures. And as Vincent has pointed out, the one that we did together. Um, so this is the combined work of Humanitech and Red Hat in this case. And that's why you see a few blue parts and a few red parts over here, which is not so much surprising. But the main question is, what do you really see, right? Um, and the answer in this case is you see some planes. Those are the big boxes. They give us a common language to speak about, so general direction. Um, and you see small boxes. And those small boxes represent capabilities. If you try to build out your own platform, um, you can probably put more boxes on the canvas, but not a lot less, because during almost any platforming attempt we have been part of, we have seen those capabilities as a minimum set. And that's exactly the reason why we did build out this reference architecture. It allows you to have a fully working IDP set up in the least amount of uh, time possible to demonstrate those workflows end to end. And that's why you need all of those capabilities in there. Um, I'm not going to double down on any of the parts, especially. Yeah, I'm just going to highlight that there is, oh, probably I can actually use the commentation feature. I don't know if you can see that. The green marks. Ah, awesome. I'm going to, to highlight that those two blocks are actually out there, um, which are um, yeah, basically segregating the repositories into different parts. You can see the application source code on the left-hand side, which is containing everything that developers are working on. And you can see the platform source code on the right-hand side, 
which is everything that the platform team or the in-front operations people in the background work on holds. And that segregation of code into repositories, that segregation of duties, that clear separation of concerns is vitally important, um, especially for inner sourcing a little bit later down the road. Because if you have everything mixed into one repository, it is really hard to tell the concerns apart and by that apply the right RBAC for the right people to collaborate on the repositories. So platforming to a certain extent is always about repository magic. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about repositories when we leave this slide. Just let me say one more thing to this. If you want to experience this on your own and also what we showed during the demo later on, um, just go ahead and grab this reference architecture from uh, GitHub. It's open source, it's free for the taking, it's completely terraformed. So you can have your own instance in, well, let's say 30 to 40 minutes, depending on how cloudy the clouds are and if you have an OpenShift cluster at your disposal. All right, so off to the next one. Oh, uh, how do I clear this? Yes, like this, okay. Right, so what you see here is the usual status quo that we meet in a lot of companies when, uh, when we look at their repository structures for the first time. Um, and what you see here is literally um, a matrix formed out of applications and environments. Yeah? So if I have a lot of applications and they go over the classic development, staging, production cycle, then what you see is a lot of concerns rolled into each and every repository and that multiplies out. If you just press uh, one button once, so we get to the gist of the slide, right? So if you do the math, you will actually find out that if you have this for 10 services and their dependencies, which are basically yeah, put down in those Terraform files, then you will see that this leads, if you want to do it times four environments, so dev, staging, QA, and prod, something like this, um, and you try to deploy this regularly, that leads to 300 to 600 files which goes to 30K revisions per month if you deploy that regularly. And if you now try to share these services among each other, how to take control of that? That's the big question, right? And that's why separating the concerns is so important, right? If you have that amount of, of, of code revisions flying around and everybody who is actually trying to, to use and reuse those services, share it internally, um, needs to check and keep up to date with all of these revisions flying around. It's already hard if you're just releasing your own software. If you multiply those dependencies in there, it gets really, really hard. So next one, please. All right, so to, to quickly sum it up, um, this gets impossible to maintain over time. Obviously, if you have no standardization baked in from the beginning, um, there are low degrees of standardization, but these repositories drift further apart over time. If you have no measures in place, that will even make it worse. Um, it doesn't allow for a lot of specialization. So inheriting from a service and then mutating that just a tiny bit to make it your own gets really much harder. And as I said, this is really not prepared for inner sourcing at all. So what would be better? Probably something like this. And this is a proposal from our side to actually take a look at your repository structure and see if you can probably move a little bit more towards this pattern. So a clear separation, first of all, between the application source code on the left-hand side over here, right, which is um, holding all of the service or application specific code, and then the platform specific code on the other side. And that is the tricky part because platform source code sounds like, okay, this is just the configuration of the platform, but there should also be in here um, the infrastructure as code. And what we like to call resource definitions. So the idea, as, as Vincent said, on how to create 
the backing instances of any kind of resources the applications need. Because that's one of the mainstays of a platform. You want to centrally control how these instances are baked and how they are shared among the world. So you get more control over them from a central instance and the developers do not need to care so much about them anymore. And that leads to the facts. Next slide, as you could have guessed, that this inverts a little bit, right? Um, if you do the math again, that leads to right about 95% less of config files to maintain because you strip down all of the infrastructure relevant code to a central location and are able to reuse it. And you get the developers onto a way to just request that from the platform. And you do only need one file um, ever. You do not need one configuration per environment. Obviously that leads to high degrees of standardization. Security is baked in. Um, it makes specialization much more easy because you do not need to care for all of the dependencies anymore. You just have the code in vision. Um, and that reduces the problem scape when modifying and maintaining changes over time a lot. It allows for self-service, which makes developers much more happy. Um, and that is a way to uh, say, or, or to, to build out repository structure and platform that is absolutely ready for inner sourcing. So that is a little bit the gist of um, what is the obvious part. Yeah, so let's go for it. And thank you, AI. This is as close as we can get to something like hammer time uh, without infringing any copyrights. Okay, so I need to take over the screen share here, right? Let's see if that works out. Just move you over to my second screen quickly. All right, I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Perfect, Yes. thank, thank you. you very much. All right. So um, as every good um, demo for a developer experience and then following platform demonstration, I'll start on the terminal. Um, the only thing I have done up to now is I've prepared my environment with a few variables, which helps me to zone in on this tenant. Um, this is my reference architecture number 41. Um, and I have already opened a few windows, so I don't need to do this because we are hard on time. Um, so the first thing we'll go to is our HDH, so Red Hat Developer Hub. As Winston said, this is a little bit the icing on the cake, but as we have a fully built out platform already here, we can for sure put icing and also cherries on the cake, right? Um, and that allows me to very quickly go to the catalog, which is in this case pretty much empty as a blank presentation demo environment and create a starting point for us to say, take a look at the main functionality that promotes inner sourcing in these uh, kind of scenarios. So first of all, I can very quickly create um, a starting point for me to use here and to demo to you because I only need to give it an application name and that will now create everything we need to have inside of the platform to start a new project or product. If there would be things inside of the catalog, I could also have um, the right actions attached to them to reuse them or to clone them depending on my likes and my needs. So this allows me to jump off to the repository and take a look at what is happening here. I got a fully functioning uh, starting point, which is including a Docker file. So it will build something, just a demo app from Docker Hub in this case. Um, it has um, a GitHub Actions-based workflow attached to it. So CI is actually building in the background already. The build is pending. Um, and I have a SCORE YAML. SCORE is a CNCF um, sandbox project by now. And it is a notation that allows developers to reason about infrastructure in the way that they like. Uh, almost not. <laughs> So as a developer, I can simply ask the platform for infrastructure here. I can say, hey, please give me a DNS record um, because I hate typing IP addresses, right? And this is what is being asked of the platform here. Um, and 
the green check mark tells me the uh, action has run. So the output has been produced. And that means if I jump over here and take a look at the thing and the catalog, I can see that there is an environment, um, but I can't inspect further into the environment. And the reason for that is that there is no runtime information available for the cluster type Git. So we are using a full GitOps flow here, which means all of the um, yeah, all of the generated artifacts have been put into a Git repository and Argo CD is actually projecting them towards the cluster. Um, and let's see, that is probably going to take a little bit of time before Argo picks that up and actually um, syncs that. But Pretty I can close. Already... Yes. Can I, can I make a few uh, comments while Argo deploys the application? Sure, go ahead, Luis. Thank you. Yeah, uh, can you go back to the to developer hub, please? Yes, cool. So one thing that we uh, are talking about here is uh, to make the services shareable, right? So uh, as you could see, elements could create a service with few clicks, right? So uh, he didn't have to, you know, ask for uh, what Git should I use? What project should I create? What, you know, can you give me access to that project in Git? So once his user is created in the platform, all the access should be created and allowed. And access should be all set up as he is a new developer in our team, right? Uh, and then he is able to take a look at the catalog, see what applications people has already built. Uh, as you can see in his screen right now, so when you go into a service, into an application, you have quickly access to the view source button, which he has already clicked open GitHub. So you can take a look at the code. And, and then you can also have a plugin. So here we have the human attack plugin in, in developer hub or backstage, which says uh, the deployment status, right? So uh, there is the Argo CD plugin that will also show here in backstage how is the application health is inside Argo CD. Uh, there is the Kubernetes or OpenShift plugin as well, which shows the uh, Resources status inside Kubernetes, so we can see the application, we can see the topology. So these plugins are, there are a lot of plugins available in the community, in Backstage uh, built in. And you can also, as an enterprise, build your own plugin. So, uh, you know, I have my own project management system and I would like to tie this application inside this project. And I could quickly write a plugin that will show a box here that shows the project state, or at least, you know, it is, it is also very easy to add links inside Backstage. So you can put another links there in the About box. So to have links to another, uh, another systems you can add there. And you can have also, it makes it easy also to make the, application uh, documents as code. So, uh, okay, I already have my document system and you can easily put a link to your document over there, to your document system over there, application documents. But you could also use document as code inside the application code base itself. So it makes it easy for developers to maintain the documentation of the application. And you can click there in view tech docs and see documentation. So these are just a few, uh, you know, technologies that helps uh, with the metrics I was I was talking at the beginning. So it makes it easy for the onboarding. It makes it easy for making the services reusable. Uh, it reduces the cognitive load because you know uh, you can you could go to the catalog and uh, pick the language you what you like to start. And as Clemens is showing, things are getting built while we are talking here. Thank you, Clemens. All right. Thank you, Louis, for 
taking us on a tour to RHDH. And as you can see, he's been talking long enough, I've been patient enough, and Argo has caught up, and we have an application, which means now I actually have introspection into the cluster, what has happened in the background. And mind you, um, let's quickly take a look back at the score file over here. Um, this is everything that I have said as a developer about the infrastructure that is needed. There's only a little bit of plumbing, like the inside and outside of my container and my entry point into my application, right? Um, and then there's the DNS record. Apart from this lovely variable, hello world, no good demo without it, I haven't said anything else, right? So let's take a look at what has happened in the background and what actually is the usual cognitive load that has or that is raining down on a developer who wants to do that. Um, if I take a look at this application, um, this is what has happened inside the Kubernetes object system, leading down here to this lovely little pod that is deployed and is actually hosting my service. So there's a ton of things happening over here, right? Um, not only the, the um, here the um, replica set, which is running my pod in a way, so it is actually um, rollingly upgradable and uh, also highly available, um, but also all of the services, all of the plumbing for uh, having a TLS certificate, um, the routing in the background, the config maps that project that lovely little variable, the secrets in the background, which are needed for all of the infrastructure. So there's a ton of things happening here. Also the access to the registry in the background to pull in the image. Yeah, all of that was created and injected by the platform, it was prepared by the platform engineers and is replicatable with this pattern so that developers do not need to care about it. And that is what Winston uh, meant when he said, platforms help to reduce cognitive load, right? I simply go over here and say, platform, please give me that and off to the races I am. Speaking of, please give me that. Let me show you one example of give me that. I would like to have posty the Postgres. And I'm simply commenting those changes, trying to be my work self. Um, I'm creating a new branch for this because um, yeah, pull requests are always good as best practice. And I'm going to propose those changes. Lovely. Now, GitHub first needs to figure out what is happening. Um, that means this merge pull request button is not available to me uh, because there are things happening in the background. Now the platform is taking over the build and further things are going to happen. Um, speaking of the devil and of patterns, while I'm showing you this, obviously for the, um, for the side of the application developer, so I could take a service and reuse it with my own service, clone it, adapt it, all of these things which are uh, in the inner sourcing domain. What I could also do is I could work in the same fashion and collaborate with the platform team on the platform source code. Yeah? All right. So this deployment has actually been successfully completed for PR1. Wait a moment, what does PR1 mean? Well, in this case, if I take a look at the orchestrator, I can see that my application up here has now two environments, one development and one PR1. And if I take a look at what is happening here in the background, I can see the material list of components that are part of my release. Oops, and now my mouse did freeze. Ah, works again. Um, and I can see my Postgres database down here, posted the Postgres, which is now part of my application. Yeah, um, I can take a look at my application architecture, so to speak, and I can do so in isolation. Why? Because this environment PR1 was created on the fly by the platform for me. So now, I actually have a very disconnected environment for the um, duration of that pull request, which allows me to do um, dedicated reviews, which allows me to look at scenarios where I have to talk to the owners of a service on how uh, an interaction pattern works, which allows me to do a ton of things that an, an isolated environment allows me to do um, to promote inner sourcing. 
right? Because right now I can't step on anybody's toes and nobody can step on my toes. And platforms allow me to get these kind of environments, these ephemeral environments um, whenever I need them. But as I said, I have posted a Postgres over here. So let's take a look at how it came to post the Postgres. If I take a look at Posty over here, I can also take a look at Posty over here in the resource management system. And there is a resource definition for Postgres from which all my Postgres databases are being spawned. Um, and I can see under which matching criteria those apply. Um, in this case, if I'm deploying a development environment, I'm going to use this definition and I can take a look at how this is actually being constructed. In this case, this is an in-cluster resource. It gets created really fast. Um, so I'm simply starting a stateful set here, which is launching a Postgres container. I could use a different definition for not development environments that allows me to say in production, hey, I want to have a cloud provider based service or I want to use that service, which is coming from this department inside of my organization. Yeah, and build out a completely different thing. But in this case, I'm just launching the container, which allows me to be very cost efficient and fast. Um, and the reason why I'm showing you this is, well, this year looks like a configuration screen and would be a horrible demo if it wouldn't be, right? But in reality, um, all of the configuration of the uh, platform, as I've shown you on the reference architecture, is also based in code, so code in, code out, so to speak. And that means I can take a look at this in a code version, and I can use the same mechanisms, like pull requests, uh, like forking, um, and actually collaborate with the platform team on that. If I need a different Postgres database, nobody stops me from working with the platform team on that. And by that, I can use the same practices that I use for uh, services to also work on the platform itself um, for inner sourcing, for crowdsourcing, for collaboration. And I enable that pattern once again by having clear separation of concerns inside of my repositories. So I can R back that in the right way and I can give the right people the right level of access and allow them to collaborate with me via pull request, for example. All right, so now having said all that, I am not going to hide the outcome of this from you. Um, and that is um, that I can see my application up here. I can go to Argo and I can see a second environment up here, a second application, which is called PR1, which has been replicated over here and I can Actually, also, if I take a look at the routes in uh, my OpenShift here, I can reload and find the routes, uh, routes of my applications. Oh, I can't. Uh, Clemens, how much there time you do you still need? We only have five I... minutes until the end of the session. I would like to have some time for Q&A just wanted to show you that this is not just dynamic and up and running. So I've not been just clicking around showing you demo stuff. This is leading to an actually running application, JTest 101 development. Yeah. All right. That's basically the end of my demo routine. So that answers the question. I'm done. And I hope that was fun.